Welcome to this new session of the Data Analysis Model, which we focus on digital images. And uh, let's start from a, a digital image of our beautiful Parkstead house. This is a grayscale image. As you can see, there are no colors in the images, just uh, gray levels. Now, if we take this image and we zoom in on a particular of the image, and then we zoom in again, we can see that we, little by little, we see more and more details about the image, until, at some point, we start seeing a large number of squares. These are the pixels of the image. You probably have done this before with other images and you know about the pixel. But what is the pixel? So the pixel is a sample of our image, a sample of the luminosity at a particular point in space that is represented by a number. In fact, when we look at how these pixels are stored in the memory of a computer, we can see that actually each pixel is associated with a, num with a number ranging from 0 to 255. This is not the case for all images, but in general this is the case for most images. So, uh, why do we have these numbers? In these, num uh, in these numbers we have low numbers, such as 0, 1, 10, represent dark parts of the image, while bright numbers represent light, uh, sorry, high numbers represent bright parts of the image. Why the numbers go from 0 to 255? Because this is the size of one byte. One byte typically is 8 bit, so you can imagine like having eight uh, switches that can be on or off. And so 256 is the number of possible combinations of all these switches, because the first one can be on or off, so two possibilities. Then the second one can also be on or off, so two other possibilities. And if you calculate 2 times 2 times 2, 8 times, you get the number 256. So this is the amount of information that can be stored in one byte. What about color images? In the case of color images, you have th actually three images in the computer memory. One which represents the information about red light, one about green light, and one about blue light. The reason why we have three color channels in one of our images is broadly related to the fact that our visual system comprises three receptors of color, so the three cones that can detect three different wavelengths of light. So having three colors in your image allows to map a full space that is the same space that we can see with our, our own eyes. Of course, if we were another species that has a much larger number of uh, cones, so detectors of color, probably would need images to be stored with more colors to start with, otherwise we would see something that doesn't uh, cover the full range of colors that we can perceive. So if one pixel occupies one byte, you can easily calculate how much memory an image will take on your computer unless it is compressed in some way. But in practice, this is very useful to know how, much, uh, how many images you can open simultaneously, for instance, on your computer, because your computer will have a certain amount of RAM memory that is used when you process an image, and you need to have at least enough memory to keep the image open. For instance, if you have an image of a particular size, say 800 pixels by 600 pixels, you can easily calculate the size by multiplying 800 times 600. 
And if it is a color image, because of what we have seen, that this image is stored three times in the computer memory, one for each channel of the image, then you will need three times as much memory. Now, we have seen that images are stored as a matrix of numbers, and many image operations, if not all the image operations that you can imagine, are just operations on numbers. For instance, uh, one operation that you can imagine is that for each pixel, here in the blue, you replace the value of those of that pixel with the average value of all the pixels in a certain neighborhood, neighborhood of the pixel. So for instance, in a, uh, in a square of a certain size around the pixel. And can you guess what happens when we do this operation, we done this operation on the image of Packer State House that I showed before? Right, here is the result. This is a blurring operation because you just replace the value of the pixel with an average of its neighborhood, and it essentially blur all the edges, all the information is smooth a little bit in space. Another operation that we can image, also, also based on pixels, is the following one. Imagine that this time we still have our pixel in blue, and we replace its value with the difference between the original value of the pixel and the average value of all the pixels in the neighborhood. Before we replaced it with a mean, and now we replace it with the difference from the mean of the other pixels. And we do this for all the pixels in the image. When we do this, this is the result that we get. We get an image in which all the edges appear, and all the surfaces that have no edges, no features, are just white that disappear from the image. So this is an edge detect. There is an analogy with something that happens also in our own eyes. Inside the retina, inside our retina, you know that we have these photoreceptors uh, that can sense light, and they are connected together with horizontal cells. So these horizontal cells are cells that take the input from the photoreceptor and inhibit the neighboring one. So it is as if they were doing this sort of subtraction. And uh, so one of the first operations that happens in our visual system already at the level of the retina, but also in the visual system of many animals, is an edge detection. Now, image analysis is a bit like cooking. There are a few things that are very easy to do to a certain level in, uh, that are reasonably good, but if you want to do it very well, it can take a huge amount of time. The aim of this module is to give you just the introduction of the main techniques of image analysis and the main operations, what we can do on images. So, uh, first of all, we would like to define some terms that will be used throughout the module. Before you can have a digital image, you need to produce it. And this is the step that is called image acquisition or digitization, image formation. This is where you go from a real world object to an image. So an image is just an estimate, a sample of the, uh, some property of the real world object and typically of the uh, luminosity of the object at any particular point in space and in time. Now, the, the, the amount of light that you can sample is not necessarily uh, visible light. We can also collect images from infrared light, such as in this example, where researchers have used an infrared camera to image penguins in their natural environment and by being an infrared camera, the image, the color in the image, is proportional to temperature. So this is very useful because we can have an idea of the temperature of different body parts of the penguin. And you can see that much of the body of the penguin is actually very cold. So 
we are measuring the temperature on the surface of the body, and some parts of the body are actually colder than the surrounding air. That might be minus 16, minus 18 degrees. This means that the penguins have a very good insulation, and so they don't lose much heat. That body is as cold as the environment in which they live. Except for some parts of the body, such as the eyes or the flippers, that you can see in the image has, are a little bit hotter. So these are the uh, parts of the body where penguins lose more heat. Probably they need to do so because these uh, are functional parts that need to, to serve another function. And so uh, in order to have a good eyesight, or to be a flippers that can be used for swimming efficiently, they need to train this efficiency against uh, heat preservation. This is one example. Another example are medical images that are often obtained through uh, X-rays, so another frequency in this broad spectrum of uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation. So light is just a small range of frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, and we have on one side uh, infrared light, and on the other side we have, for instance, uh, uh, ultraviolet light, X-rays, and so on. And all the, the entire spectrum of uh, light can be used to produce images. Images can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. And in both cases, they are sampled in a 2D space or in a 3D space of the object uh, in the real world. Now that we have seen image formation, let's see some other terms that are very useful. One is image processing. Image processing is any operation or series of operations on images that start from one image and results in another image that can be enhanced or modified in a particular way. For instance, in this example, we have an image of cells and then we apply particular processing that results in a series of edges detected for each cell. So we have transformed one image in another image. Another term that is quite useful is image analysis. So analysis is slightly different from processing in that in image analysis you start from one image and you a final result is a series of numbers, of data, that characterize the image. So much of our module, uh, the, the, the short bit of our module that focuses on images, will be focusing on image analysis. We will have some images and we want to collect some data from the image. Then there is computer graphics. This is something that actually we have done already, even if only to a small extent, in the previous two weeks of the module. Because computer graphics is the visualization as an image of data, it's the opposite of image analysis. In, in computer graphics, you start from a series of numbers and you represent those numbers as an image. So, in, in a sense, making plots, that's what we have done in the previous weeks of the module, is a form of computer graphics. A different term is computer vision. In computer vision, you enter an image to your system, and the output is an interpretation of the image. It is a bit like when you use uh, the search by image on Google. In this case, you input an image to the system, and what you get is a short description of the image, maybe the image of a dog or something else, that is interpreting the content of the image. And finally, uh, visualization is a way of transforming some data into a representation. 
Now I would like to introduce two main classes of operations that can be done on digital images. The first class are intensity operations, so operations that affect each pixel only based on its intensity, on the number that is associated with that particular pixel, without taking into account the neighboring pixels. So these operations will affect each pixel in the image only based on its value and not on the value of its neighboring pixels. Or you probably have uh, experience of these intensity operations from, from the past because uh, some of them are very common. One is, for instance, changing the brightness or contrast of an image. And I want to illustrate this with an example that comes from real uh, biological sciences and zoology research. This is a frame from a video of marching locusts. As you know, locusts will start moving in large uh, swarms when their density becomes high or when some particular environmental conditions are met. And in, in this experiment, a group of researchers was filming the swarm from above. And we can see this is a grayscale image, where, which is mostly gray, which is the, so the color of the soil, once you convert it to grayscale. And then we can see these black or dark dots, which are the locusts. We can see, for, because of each pixel in the, the image is a number, we can plot the histogram of these numbers. And this is what the graph on the right of the slide represents. So this histogram will see, you will see as a very large, very high peak uh, around the gray level that corresponds to the background, meaning that there are many, many pixels that have that particular color of the background. There is another peak in the histogram, which is so tiny that you probably don't even see it in the image, which is the peak associated with the color of locusts. So there are many pixels that are dark, uh, dark gray, almost black, which is the color of a locust. And these pixels will form a peak in the histogram. But because most of the surface of the image is just background and the locusts are quite small, we can only see a very tiny peak in the image. Now, an intensity operation would change this histogram because, uh, for instance, if you increase the brightness, all the pixels that used to be dark become lighter. All the numbers that used to be 0, 10, 20, tends to become higher numbers. They become 8, 100, 200, hmm? all in proportion. And what, so what happens to the histogram? If all the numbers become higher, it means that the histogram is shifting to the right, it's shifting towards higher intensity values. And uh, so changing brightness of an image, increasing brightness in particular, will lead to a shift of the histogram to the right, and to, in, in, in the real image, in the image, to an increase of brightness. There are other operations that you can run on the intensity levels of the image. For instance, you can increase or decrease the contrast. If you increase the contrast, you will have more extreme values for the pixels. So whereas to start with, maybe you had only uh, gray levels with value around 100, if you increase the contrast, you will have more extreme values. Some pixels will become closer to zero or even zero, and some pixels will become uh, much brighter up to 255, that we know is the maximum possible value in our image. Changing the brightness or the contrast of an image are two examples of intensity operations. There is another one which is quite important and is a very dramatic intensity of the operation, which is thresholding. Let's illustrate this with an image of our Parkstead house from, the, from before. 
For this image again, we can plot the histogram of pixel values for uh, each value of the pixels. And we can see that there are broadly two peaks with very complex histogram because it's a very complex image with dark regions such as the trees and some brighter images, brighter regions such as the sky or some part of the, uh, of the past house. And the thresholding consists in essentially increasing the contrast to the point where all the pixels are either completely dark or completely bright, either 0 or 255. So we split the histogram at some point, we decide of a point in the histogram, a value in the image, and we assign to the, all the pixels that were below that value, so that they, they were darker than that particular value, will become dark and black, and all the pixels that were brighter than that particular value will become white. In itself, in this case, the, the thresholding will lead to this image, which uh, is not particularly useful for us, but there are many occasions in which thresholding is a useful operation because it can be used for what is called in image processing, the segmentation of the image. So segmentation is the partition of the image in two or more components, typically one component uh, representing all the background pixels and one component representing all the foreground pixels. So let's illustrate with this example. This is a frame from a video with a fish, mosquito fish, swimming in a tank. And we can see that fish tend to be darker than the tank. But they, of course, they, there is a whole range of gray levels for both the tank and the fish. So by applying a thresholding operation, we can impose all the fish to be classified as dark objects, for instance, and all the, the background pixels to be classified with a bright color, with another color. And at this point, the color that we give to objects and backgrounds is no longer a proper color, it's more like a label. And this is why in this image I'm not representing the color as black or white, but for instance I'm representing it as red labels. So thresholding is a way to segment the image, to separate the objects from the background. It's a, one of the simplest methods to segment an image. The second class of operations that can be done on images are neighborhood operations. So before the operations on the intensity of pixels all involved each pixel independently. But neighborhood operations involve a pixel and its neighbor. A neighborhood that can be defined in different ways. One example of operation that involves the neighborhood of a pixel is the one that we have seen just before, which is blurring, where you replace the value of a pixel with the average value of all its neighbors within a certain range of distance. And these neighborhood operations are quite important because they are often used as intermediate steps of image analysis and also of computer vision. Some of these operations, such as the blurring one, just involve a linear transformation of all the pixels within a neighborhood, but some can be highly nonlinear. One example that is quite extreme are the binary operations, so the operations on binary images. After we have thresholded an image, we have this representation in which all the pixels are, say, either black or white say black if they represent an object, and white if they represent the background. And there are a number of operations that can uh, be performed on these binary images, so, which are morphological binary operations. These binary operations are, for instance, the digestion, 
where you essentially start from an object, a binary object, and you delay it. So you assign to the object also all the pixels that touch at least one of the, the object pixels. Or the erosion, where again you start from an object and you remove all the pixels that touch the perimeter of the object. And then uh, another binary operation that is quite useful is the labeling of connected components. In this operation, all the pixels that touch each other will be given the same label. For instance, uh, you can define two types of connectivity. You can say that two pixels touch each other if they share a face and this is the four connectivity because each pixel can have up to four neighbors or you can decide that two pixels can um, be associated if they share either a face or a corner and this is the eight connectivity because in this case a single pixel can have up to eight neighbors so after defining these types of connectivity you can um, associate together, group together, pixels that belong to the same object. So by combining together all these binary operations, you can use, for instance, erosion to separate objects that are close to each other. And then you can use deletion to retrieve the original size of the objects. And then you can use uh, the labeling of connected components to associate together pixels that belong to the same object. This is quite useful in the process of image segmentation because you can now associate a pixel not just to either the object or the background, but to a particular object inside the image. So we have seen how digital images are encoded in the memory of a computer and uh, so the, what a pixel is for both grayscale images and color images. And then we have defined some of the terms that are related to images, for instance image analysis and image processing and the differences between these diff different broad uh, operations that can be done on, on images. And then we have seen some of the basic transformations that can be done on an image. And uh, broadly, we can uh, divide these transformations and operations in one group, which are the operations that only affect each pixel independently of its neighbor. For instance, the intensity operations, changing the contrast or the brightness of the pixel. While other operations are spatial operations, so the output of the operation depends not just on one single pixel, but on its neighbors as well. And these spatial operations, we have seen a few examples, range from just blurring, where a, a pixel is replaced with an average value of all, all the neighbors within a certain range, to more complex operations, non-linear operations, such as the morphological operations on binary images. And then we have briefly introduced the process of image segmentation, which is the, the topic of our uh, workshop tomorrow in the practical.